Welcome to the Inspiring Tech Leaders podcast with me, Dave Roberts. This week, I have the pleasure to be talking with Saba Carter as my special guest. Saba has recently served in the role of CIO at News Corp and a member of their board of directors for News Technology Services. Saba is also the chair for the Corporate IT Forum's Members Council and has held senior roles within Pearson English, the BBC Worldwide, Cap Gemini, Two Wire, and the Financial Times. She has a BA degree in politics and economics from Goldsmiths College and an MSc in Business Systems Analytics and Design from City University of London. It's fantastic to have you here today with us, Saba. Thank you, Dave. It's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to start off by just understanding, yeah, how did you start your career in IT? And yeah, was it that career path that you always wanted to follow? Uh, actually, it wasn't at all. I studied politics and economics uh, as my undergraduate. And uh, I thought I was going to be a journalist. That was where my interest was. So uh, I took a job, a summer job at the FT, the Financial Times, thinking that that would be my entry onto the editorial floor. And at that time, the dot-com era was starting. I'm going to give my age away now. Um, But um, FT was thinking about its online presence and was launching FT.com. And I joined a team uh, which was advertised, putting adverts up, actually, on the site for the sales team. And someone very quickly spotted my comfort around technology and the ability to bridge technical and non-technical teams. And soon I I was just invited to formally join the technology team. And I I never looked back. I I very quickly went on to deliver a number of programs for them and moved out to New York for a while um, to oversee their North American technology portfolio. At that point, I knew I wanted to continue in technology, but I didn't have a background in that training. Uh, so I went off and ended my MSc in business systems analysis and design and decided I was going to commit to technology. That must have been a fantastic experience, though, getting to travel and see other parts of the world. It was brilliant. And I tell you what was really good, Dave, is it... You know, headquarters for, for FT is London. That is the main office. But it had the well, at that time what we would call the satellite offices. Now they're regional. They're much more developed. They're much more established. But it was a great experience being in a smaller regional office of an organisation where the head, HQ was in another region and getting a really good humbling experience of what it's like to to have you know strategy told to you and and now I think I have a lot more empathy when I deal with teams which are in other regions to make sure that actually you know you communicate and get that buy-in from all areas at first and I think that I've really learned a lot of that from that role. You've also gone on to have other senior roles with a number of high profile organizations you know you worked in Capgemini and the BBC and Persons English and uh, you know what experiences did you gain from those roles? Oh, and and like you mentioned, they're, they're so varied and diverse. So, you know, a number of them were very small startups to wire through to large organizations like Capgemini, which were doing large transformations at HMRC. Um, and then working within organizations, I've worked in a number of media organizations, which have been producing content and thinking about their audiences. So I've been really fortunate to, to be in roles where I've undertaken internal transformations for technology, but also been involved in products which are actually going to market. And I think that's given me a real appreciation that there isn't always a one size fits all. There isn't always one approach to do for something and get out the right outcome. It's really about thinking what you want to achieve and bringing the right teams to do that. And I've been really lucky to work with very diverse teams um, across the globe. Um, and, and that's really, really helped me think about what the best way to approach things are. So what do you think are those main challenges that leaders face in their roles today? And, and how is you know, technology disrupting organisations? It's a great question. I think certainly in, in the more recent roles, the, the size of the scale of the organizations I've been involved in, something that when an organization gets beyond a certain size, it starts thinking about how to be more efficient and wants to scale and create something once and reuse multiple times. But you also want to be cognizant that a lot of those teams are delivering products locally to their particular markets or to their internal users, and they want to be quick and swift and agile locally. So that balance between trying to actually be have the economies of scale, but also be quick locally. I think large companies are definitely grappling with that and trying to use technology to bridge that. The, the other issue that certainly in the publishing companies that we've experienced is we saw a lot of publishing companies take their products online, 
but they did it in a sort of lift and shift way. If they had a paper, they took it literally. I don't know if you remember, but, you know, literally would take the content and put it online. Mm. And I think we've got much better about thinking about how technology can help us disrupt and, and interact with our audiences in a different way. We can use the data to understand our consumer, our customer better, and we can actually then engage them with things that are personalized to how they want to actually um, interact with us. Um, the issue, obviously, that brings with it is issues around data privacy mm. and transparency of how we're using data. And I think GDPR and CCPA, they address the transactional side of data, but I think there's a lot of disruption and change that we need to think about around the principles and ethics of how we use data. And that should be a really big focus now as well for technology companies. It's something we really need to think about. But the other advantages technology has given us is, you know, just how fast we can move now. The cloud has made it so easy to prototype and deliver new ideas without having to make great investment initially, which we couldn't think about decades ago. So you, you mentioned the efficiency and, and security there. So how do organizations actually go about ensuring that they, they remain efficient, reliable, secure, but also able to still scale their organization and, and the growth of, of their business? Yeah, it's a really good question because technology was so much simpler before and you had boxes in, in one room and you could lock them down and, and it was just much easier to think about how you were going to keep things secure. Um, now data and technology is prevalent everywhere in all aspects of our lives. And because of that, it, it makes it so much harder to draw the boundaries and apply how you're going to be more secure. From the time you enter a building and your ID card gets swiped um, to the time that you communicate and send an email to someone, or if you send personal details, your bank details, if you're trying to buy something, we, in our personal and professional lives, it's become really hard. And I think um, it's quite alarming how easily people will send you know, sensitive data and not realize the risks associated. There's almost a herd mentality. If someone else is doing something, it must be safe. Um, so raising education awareness has been a real focus. Security, you know, it's, it's cliche, but it's so true. Security is everyone's problem and yeah. uh, you're as strong as your weakest link. So we do a lot of awareness programs, a lot of education, um, unexpected gamification. We will just test people all the time and we won't tell them we're going to do it just because it's usually when when you're not expecting it, that you're going to get caught out. Um, and at NTS, it was brilliant. When I was um, overseeing the uh, Bangalore office, we really tried to gamify that education. And, and the, the leadership team really embraced that idea. Right, for, It wasn't just the technology teams. It was the HR, finance functions. Everyone really embraced the idea that security was something everyone had to be cognizant of. And, and we're very alert around data as well because the new GDPR rules had been coming in around that time and thinking about how we were going to make sure that we were thinking about privacy and access and data around that. Uh, it's a continuous effort. I've gone through ISO 27001 with uh, a couple of organisations now, and I think that level of compliance and standard helps to bring the, the, the awareness of, of security uh, and, and uh, cybersecurity posture to the, to the entire organization. I think that helps to you know, really drive the right type of culture within an organization as well. So have you had experience of, of going through those sorts of uh, ISO certification processes? Yeah, absolutely. I think what tends to happen, though, is depending on the size and scale of your organization, the discipline can be different. So if you're in an organization that's banking or it's insurance, it's manufacturing, I think the discipline around some of those uh, aspects is much better. And I think it would be fair to say that when you're in some of the more creative or smaller organizations that are establishing, then the standards aren't quite the same um, and the maturity of the individuals in the organization and thinking about those isn't the same and and therefore you, you can lean on those standards to some extent but I think there's something around creating a culture where um, you're trying to make sure people are aware of it it's also changing because we're starting to think about how we're going to allow people to be more flexible and use their own devices etc so Going back to those standards, unless you're going to apply it to particular systems and processes, that's fine. And if you can actually corner off and boundary it. But if you actually are going to now enter this world where you want to be completely flexible and you want people to be able to do as much as possible, 
we're, we're all learning actually in that um, area. And I don't think there are defined mature standards. So I think that we ha- you have to set the bar quite high yourself and, and, and keep trying new things and, and innovating in a space that actually you want, you want to be risk averse. So it's almost contradictory as a culture. I think it's interesting you you mentioned about innovating there because how do you actually go about creating that culture of innovation while also keeping the the business secure as as we've just talked about you know where do you start with actually creating that type of environment that still encourages that creativity to occur yeah absolutely and I think to be fair I'm not suggesting suddenly that everyone go out and start trying and piloting lots of things (laughs) with sensitive data um, it's, it's about sort of assessing where it where it's not high risk, where it's not going to cause issues. So if it is something around customer data, if it is something around privacy, that's not the pl- place to tie a pilot it and test it. But if I look back, I, I still remember in my early days when I was at the FT, when the BlackBerry had just come out, I'm going to start showing my age now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and everyone and all the sales teams wanted them. They were really excited and they were saying, you know, I could be sitting in a cab and I could have closed a deal and I want to be able to just update it in the system straight away. I don't want to wait till I get back to the office to do it. And there was this big tension between the security teams and the sales teams because security teams were saying it's not secure. We can't do it. Fast forward, it seems like a crazy conversation to have. You know, if I said that to now to a colleague, they would they would laugh that, you know, why would that not be secure? So that change came because people did push the boundaries. They did want to make that innovation happen. Banks did accept that it would be okay to do things like that. And, and slowly we brought that culture in. So I, I think it's not just about sort of testing it in a sort of unsafe way but it's about just making sure that you're still following those standards and steps but you're not saying just because it hasn't been done it can't be done. I suppose it's also about encouraging people to look at uh, innovation uh, with the the, the principles of security by design so that you, 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 you build it in from the foundation and you get it right from the onset it is not security is never an afterthought about anything you're creating or building it, it should always be part of the DNA of, uh, Absolutely. And, and this is going to just become, you know, some part and parcel of the world we inhabit, because if you think about, the, you know, new connectivity, 5G being rolled out and um, the interoperability between providers that's going to be needed, we're not going to suddenly say, well, that's not secure. You want to have a seamless experience. You want people to to not have a, you know friction in that experience and be connected on one line and then be interrupted and lose the application. So for all of that, there's going to have to be trials and testing around security for connectivity. And we're all going to have to lean in to to make that happen for our own benefits. And what type of innovations have have your teams been involved in or looking to probably adopt? I think for us, certainly, you know, we, we really have been focused on trying to make sure that we can free up enough of the investment in the company to put it into the things that are important for us in content and product. And to do that, we want to keep our operating costs very low. And for technology, we've really lent in and thought about the automation, streamlining of processes and understanding the company's core asset, which is data, um, and really, really sticking to the fundamentals at the moment. I think it's really easy to talk about some of these new emerging techs and get seduced by the technology, but they're not at the scale where we can use them and commercialize them for a media company at the moment. I think, um, you know, that that's we're not quite there yet. Everyone keeps talking about the new AR, VR technology, but I, I think we're a little bit away in terms of the speed and what we can do before we can adopt it at mass. What about the, the, the skills that are needed within a team, though, to support you know, such technologies and that they're coming through? You know, what are you putting in place for, for, for teams in terms of support? I think um, it's, it's a good question. I mean, talent is an issue anyway to recruit for technology now. And now we're in a global marketplace. Um, COVID aside, the pandemic aside, we were already looking to sort of leverage talent in different locations. And really, it's about bringing together diverse teams who can problem solve on these issues together and and get the best out of them. So really, for for me, it's been about leaning in and finding the right people, no matter where they are, um, and and sort of setting them up with the environment to be able to innovate. I, I do think that sometimes because we want to scale and deliver, 
we as companies push our teams to do things that are repeatable um, because we feel that that will make them quicker but actually something that's repeatable and scalable usually is not very creative so if you are um, solving a new problem you don't want to bring necessarily a repeatable process you want the team to be able to just think about it and i and, and ideate together to some extent so i think really thinking about the outcome you're looking to achieve with the team and then setting up the right environment for them so you also mentioned there about a, a diverse team so what are you doing to help ensure that there is that diversity and inclusion within technology teams yeah it, i mean diversity is a continuous effort and and it's a real conscious effort it doesn't happen just because you say you want a diverse team it doesn't just suddenly happen and although we've made some really great gains in improving the gender balance within our teams and the experience because it's not just about gender or about race it's about diversity of ideas it's really hard to make it happen because as i mentioned the talent pool is actually quite competitive it's hard to get good talent anyway and on top of that if you're applying extra criteria and saying on top of that I want them to be of a certain background I want them to be a certain gender and I want them to come from certain areas it's it's almost impossible the one thing I do worry about is that we are starting to increase the number of women in technology but I'm still seeing them in the softer roles in technology I don't I I feel still it's very hard to recruit women in what I would call the hard technology roles the um, um architecture um, if you're looking at sort of coding. Um, so from that perspective, my, my concern is not all roles pay equally. And if we're talking about sort of reducing that gap, pay gap between the genders and tech by introducing more women in technology, I think we also need to think about what roles they will do in technology. It's not just about having more women in tech, but it's about having a diversity of people across all types of teams. And that's really going to help the innovation as well. Absolutely agree with that. It's uh, so w- w- with those teams, what what are the the types of roles that you are seeing emerging um, as, as new opportunities today? I think you know, obviously, if you're in tech, you need to understand the tech. That makes sense. That's that's obviously a given. But I think that we've moved away from the traditional boxes and networks um, and storage sort of view of technology because technology is so pervasive in everything we do really understanding the business and understanding the social use of technology um, is really becoming critical to technologists who work in organizations because they are the glue we are the glue that actually joins the dots and thinks about how all the different functions of an organization can come together to produce whatever it is you're producing it's um, the privilege of being in, in technology is that you're dealing with marketing and sales and editorial or manufacturing or you get to actually work with all the different functions. But as a result of that, the people that you really need in teams are not just good technologists. They need to be collaborators, people who can bring teams together, who can think about how to problem solve together. And I've, I've worked with some really great engineers But if they haven't been able to articulate their ideas or work as part of a team, they've been surpassed by others who really can master the art of words. So I I do think developing those skills is now paramount importance um, to get ahead in technology. What are those skills that you think are needed for executives in technology to actually be able to articulate the strategic value to the rest of the C-suite? What are those key communication skills required? Yeah, you know, I personally spend a lot of time doing this and I I know that a lot of colleagues do is I think it's less about communicating the value of technology to the rest of the business, but it's more about communicating the value of technologists. The more that we're moving to off the shelf solutions and solutions which are as a service, it's easy for organizations to see the technology function just as a broker and not see the real value that the technology department can add to the organization as a whole. Um, But if you want to avoid things like vendor lock-in and you want to keep security front and center, and you want to ensure that your data and your digital assets are being leveraged in the full way that they can, you really need a technology partner to help you navigate that really diverse landscape. If If you end up with each function going out and getting its own solutions, you'll end up with a very siloed estate And you won't be able to have that enterprise view that you can then get efficiencies on a much grander scale with. So I I think that it's really important 
you know, to, for them to understand what role technologists will help in, in partnering with them. So that there, there is also that, that pressure, I guess, all the time to encourage uh, and develop digital transformation within a business and an organization and to, to keep pushing the boundaries. But how do you, how do, you do that? while also keeping the uh, supporting the legacy systems and keeping the, the business as usual operations running? How do you manage to get a balance of, of both? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a really good question because in, in a number of companies where I've worked where they have a mix of products, which are um, products which have a legacy uh, estate and products which don't, you can really see the advantage that the latter have. If a product doesn't have a legacy um, background, um, the tech stack tends to be simpler. They can innovate very quickly. They can think they, they're not locked in with this is how we had it before. This is what our bricks and mortar um, function looks like, or this is what our print fun, you know, uh, product looks like, then they're not held back by that thinking. And they also don't have to think about any old technology they're still maintaining. So, um, but the learning from that for me is being able to keep a separation between those teams, um, small focus teams that are looking to not boil the ocean, you know, manageable outcomes quickly to keep um, momentum and keep energy levels of the team up as well. Because if you are maintaining legacy systems, it can be quite demoralizing to see other people working on really sexy, new, innovative ideas. So yeah. small focus teams, but rotating people to try and get uh, as much variety for them as well. But having the same teams work on legacy and innovation, I don't think that works. And I haven't seen a lot of people still adopting that. I think that is the the balance that we've uh, we've got to try and achieve. And it, yeah. it's, uh, I think you're absolutely right, and I hear that from uh, many other people as well. Is it, it's that rotation that's required? You, you know, you you, uh, you can't have just one group that's just purely dedicated to the new transformational and innovation work, and uh, having another team that is um, you know supporting the the, the legacy systems because, uh, as you as you say, it it, it can be uh, quite demoralising for for those that are. Uh, not getting to develop their own skills and, and talent so absolutely. absolutely absolutely agree with everything you said there so 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 far in your career you know what have been the highlights to date and you know what's been the, the proudest moment in your career so far uh, I've, I've been really fortunate to have worked in some really great companies and just I personally just really enjoy working with teams to overcome difficult problems. Uh, I'm a problem solver at heart. So if someone says something can't be done or it's really difficult, I find it really hard to resist the challenge. Uh, so whether it's implementing a finance transformation program in within one year to hit the year end date or uh, launching a completely new site and team within months, as we did with NTS for News Corp, or even launching a new platform for a new market in time for Chinese New Year, which we did at Pearson English, I just love being part of large transformations and, and I've been fortunate to be in companies which have trusted me to, to lead such initiatives for them and, and work with really diverse and very talented people uh, while doing that. So what is that best bit of advice that you received during your career ascent and what would be the advice that you would give to other people now starting out a, a career in technology? I think... Um, it's, it's less about a specific piece of advice, but it was something that I was able to do very early on. The FT, when I joined them, had a great rotation scheme. They would move you around all the departments. So you got to work in the networks team. You got to work in development. You, got to, you had to work in PMO and understand the finance side of it. You, you had to work on, um, you know, our storage area. And through that, you got a really good appreciation holistically of technology. I, I hear a lot of people talking about coding all the time now and how everyone has to learn to code. And it puts a lot of pressure, one, to specialize very early on before you might have realized what your own strengths are. I think technology is really diverse and there are so many different roles people can do and play to their own strengths instead of just trying to fit into a box. So my, the best advice I would certainly give to other people is what I was able to do myself um, is to really try and, and try everything, try as, as for as long as you want 
and and then try and do what you think you you enjoy and you're and you're good at instead of what you think people are telling you you know is the future um, because there's going to be lots of opportunities to do things in lots of different ways and if we're to believe the hype there won't be a lot of code soon it's all going to be low code and no code that, I think that's really good advice. So thank you once again for sharing your career insights and experience and being part of the uh, Inspiring Tech Leaders podcast. Thank you so much, Dave. Pleasure to be with you. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and stay tuned for more Inspiring Tech Leaders.